Perfect. Yay. Yay. I did I did it right this time. I know. We hit the button. We did not forget to hit record. That's a good thing. Wonderful. I know, I know. Um, so how are you, Joe? Awesome. Are we ready? Everybody got drinks? I got drinks. I, I in their potty breaks. Yeah, I have my my drink in a cup so I don't get shamed anymore. Yeah, we match. We match. But let me go grab a drink real quick. Okay. All right. We match. We match. The, the boys will be so proud that we're using their mugs. I, I made sure to keep it clean for, so that I could use it today. Cat, get <laughs> out of my way. That cat, man. What's the cat's name? We need to know. <laughs> the only thing I can't control is my cat. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> What's the cat's name, Joe? Calypso. 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 I have two okay. of them. I have two okay. of them. And the other one is named uh, Joby. Joby. And Calypso is kind of a multicolored mess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, we have eight. Eight cats. I'm allergic to every single one of them. Wow. Yeah. Um, Zertech D and I are best friends. Three, two, two, one. one. Welcome back to another episode of Shit That Goes On Our Heads. I'm G-Rex with my awesome partner, Dirty Skittles. And today we have an amazing guest, Joe. Hey, Joe, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to hear your story, Joe. I'm, I'm excited to tell my story. A little, little bit nervous because I've never, never told my story before except to professionals and to other people in the mental ward. We, we are so, far from, we're far from professionals. Far. <laughs> Probably <laughs> closer to the people in the mental ward. Yeah. Okay, well, at least I'm in, <laughs> I'm in a good company then. <laughs> yes. We can guarantee you a good company. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Don't be nervous. It's like we're just a group of humans talking, sharing our stories. That's right. Where do you want to start, Joe? Where does oh, it begin? Well, it begins in, in, in 2008. That's not when I was born or anything. That's just when my... Because <laughs> I was going to say, if you were mental... born in 2008, damn, you're young. Yeah, no, my, my mental health journey journey uh, started in in 2008. And I was diagnosed bipolar. And that story is rather interesting because of what had happened in the, and what occurred. It was just came on me kind of suddenly. I found myself calling 911 and threatening the president of the United States. And I would not recommend this to people to do. <laughs> not a thing to do. But you will get quick service by the police department. I, I lived in a 12-story secured building at the time. And they were at my door in under a minute. Not, wow. not to want to be let in the security door downstairs, but actually at my door in under a minute. Yeah, it was very quick. And the cops came in and talked to me for a few minutes, probably about, oh, 15 minutes or so. And then they took me to the, to the hospital and checked me into the metal ward, into the, into the lockdown facility. I was there for, for three days and the doctor who was treating me didn't even like realize the secret service were going to come talk to me or anything and i said oh no they'll they'll they'll, come, they'll be talking to me sure enough within that three days about two and a half days into it the secret service showed up to talk to me and figure out why i did that and you know what was going on probably talked to me for about another 10 or 15 minutes or so with a bunch of other people in the room that I, I didn't realize were in the room. I mean, I, I realized there are a bunch of people in the room, probably about 10 people or so observing, observing this meeting. And it was, yeah, that's what I, 
I realized I, I was really in the shit, you know, and had to do kind of some fast talking to, to kind of get myself out of this shit a little bit. I mean, what do you, what do you say? Yeah. Like, were you scared? I would have been scared shitless. Not really. Not really. I kind of knew what was going to happen. I wasn't really that nervous or anything about, you know, talking to the secret service or anything. And, and, and I want to say that they're, they're a bunch of very nice guys. At least, at least the, the one I talked to, he was, he was very nice and, and friendly and, you know, non-confrontational and, you know, just, just, it was just an interview. He just wanted to find out who I was and more about me and, and, you know, why I, why I thought the president. Yeah. Then they let me go. My mom picked me up and everything was good. And then, uh, uh maybe a month and a half later, I ended up in the mental ward again, which I can't really talk about too much. As far as what happened and stuff, all I, all I can really say is I uh, had to, uh, against medical advice, check myself out of the mental ward because they gave me too much medication. So I, I had to do that for my own my own safety and kind of made me afraid of the mental ward after that to where I didn't want to go back. Did you find that, like, when you were put in the mental ward, that they they weren't really talking to you so much, but they were pushing more meds towards you? It was, it was both. You know, there was a lot of talk. There was a lot of groups. You know, that's the mental ward. There's a lot of groups and stuff like that that you can participate in or not. It's, it's purely voluntarily. It's up to you. The meds are also voluntary. So they say, unless you get, you know, combative or something, and then, the, you know, they can restrain you and do what they have to do to make you not so combative. Luckily, I was never that way in the mental ward, so I never got that, never got that treatment. And as far as the the overdose goes, I don't know if it was just a mistake or nobody caught it or, or whatever, but yeah, it was, was not a good, uh, not a good scene. And then I, I ended up in the mental ward again, probably a, a year or so later, maybe two years later, something like that. I still had this definitely fear of, of the mental ward, but I realized I need these people. You know, I have, I have a mental illness and it took me a good, probably six to nine months to a year to a year and a half to kind of come to terms with the whole mental illness and deciding I had an issue, which is bipolar one with psychosis. So I have, oh, go ahead. I was like, I have so many questions, Joe. So if at any point I ask you something that you're like, I don't want to talk about that, just feel free to stop me. Yeah, go ahead. Um, So throughout your life, before you got your diagnosis, was this a pattern where you would have these, I guess, episodes, if if that's the right word? Well, I uh, it's funny you mention that because I I had another run in with a president before I threatened a president. I actually uh, cussed out Bill Clinton to his face back in ninety five on the street, and uh, so I I would say there's there's been kind of half cock to say the least. So my, my mouth gets me in trouble. I just figured it was just a, another one of my times of my mouth getting me in trouble and, you know, having to dig out of it with the whole threatening of the president. I didn't, I didn't think anything of the, of being bipolar or anything, but that's the diagnosis they gave me. So that's the diagnosis yeah. I had to accept and, yeah. you know, go on, go on medication and stuff which is always a fun thing to do and get dialed in on and stuff. And luckily I got dialed in pretty early. So I didn't have too much of a, of a roller coaster ride with the medications. They did a little bit, not too bad. A pretty, pretty good psychologist, psychiatrist that uh, knew what they were doing and gave me the right cocktail. So. 
that's that's good so in those moments like when you're staring at like you mentioned bill clinton and you're saying what you're saying are you present in that moment like do you or do you like think back like oh shit what did i just do oh i'm i'm fully present in the moment and and it's not till later i'm like what the fuck did i just do (laughs) you know Okay. But but that's far after the fact. And it's funny because even, even now, I'm learning from that situation. So I, I do try to learn from these situations that, that I find myself in. Even if it's, hey, don't do that again. Hey, wait, you did it again. What are you doing? <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's like, why do you keep doing the things you do? I don't know. It's interesting just the way... The brain works and processes stuff that we learn from from really the the failures more than we do the success of the, of, of our lives. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's hard, right, to look back on like something that wasn't a success. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it took me a long time to to get to that point. I'm, I'm finally there, though, and looking at my failures and thinking, you know, what a wonderful thing that was <laughs> yeah i mean but it is right so <clears throat> i guess when what was the breaking point for you where you realized okay i i do need to to take my mental health like what that diagnosis is into consideration it was it was probably not too long after coming out of the mental ward the third time or fourth time something like that where i you know, that's when the people in the mental ward just told me, hey, you're, you're sick and you need to get better. And this is where you get better. You know, them telling me that really, really kind of eased my mind. I don't know why, but it just did. And I, I think I needed to hear that to to ease my mind and, and be able to deal with everything I, I was going through or or have been going through. My my mom passed away in the beginning of all this happening, um, so I was dealing with dealing with that as well. So that was that was very difficult. Um, she she died rather suddenly, and mm-hmm. that was also a very kind of made my paranoia go through the roof a little bit, just because of what happened and everything. Yeah, that sounds really hard. When when I when I go delusional, I I tend to think I work for the government and yeah, weird weird stuff like that. So I tend to be investigated by the government and or think I'm being investigated by the government. It's one of those investigations you wouldn't know is happening. So <laughs> oh, like yeah. like one of those super yeah. secret uh, yeah. operations. Yeah. Yes. 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 So it's kind of interesting and, and something I had to always keep in the back of my mind that is the man watching me. And even even now, you know, giving this interview, you know, talking around things and, you know, not giving you the, the full, complete story because I, I don't, you know, I don't feel comfortable. Yeah, no, that's, know, that's so. fine. So, Joe, I, I do have a question. I mean, do you do you kind of wish that your diagnosis had come earlier on in life? Or were you comfortable with the diagnosis when it was given to you? I think I would have dealt with it a little bit better, maybe if it was earlier in life, maybe. Mm. No, actually, I'm 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 happy with when it happened. And a lot of uh, bipolar diagnoses happen later in life. A lot of them happen around the age of between 25 and 32. And... I was like 24 at the time. That's 20, crazy. 25. So since since your diagnosis and understanding that that you have this bipolar diagnosis, I guess, I hate, hate to say the word so many times, but since that has happened, what what tools and treatment, like what does that look like for you on a day-to-day basis? I, uh, I have a psychologist. Uh, I talk to him every couple of months. Um, to kind of check in and, you know, see how things are going, make sure I'm taking my meds and make sure I'm stable on my meds and, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I have a psychiatrist to meet with him uh, 
every three to six months. It's been about every six months now that I've stabilized all my meds. When I come out of the mental ward, I, I meet with them a little bit more often, like on a monthly basis, or in the case of the psychiatrist on a couple month basis. So yeah, it's it gets to be pretty, you know, pretty routine after a while once mm-hmm. you once you get into the get in kind of the swing of things and it can get dialed in. But it's really that dialed in process that, that takes so much time. And some people never get dialed in and they're always on the slippery slope. And some people are like me and have been stable for, you know, are fairly stable for, you know, five years plus. Yeah. So when you say dialed in, is it learning to be self-aware and like what is dialed in? Dialed in with your medication and 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 then there is, you know, the self-awareness part of it, realizing what triggers are. Like for me, I had to I had to stop reading governmental books for uh a few years mm-hmm. um, before I could go back to to reading that kind of stuff. I had to go back to I had to stop reading military fiction stuff too for the for the same reason. And stress. I had to really watch my stress level and, and lower my stress level. I would say that's probably the number one thing is is to lower lower your stress level because that's what that's what triggers most people is a lot of stress. And how do you yeah. how do you manage your stress these days? Sorry. That's exactly what I was going to ask. So we're on the same page. Well, I uh, I do meditate, and that that helps out quite a bit. I don't formally meditate anymore. I did meditate every day for about thirty to forty five minutes a day for a while, a number of years. But now I do more of a subconscious meditation. So when I find myself getting stressed or whatever, I uh, you know, I, I just try to get calm and focus myself into into my breathing and and just relax. And if that doesn't work, then I, I have to take medication, which I haven't had to do in a, in a, in a long time because I'm I'm able to control it most of the time with through uh, through meditation and just kind of controlling my thoughts mm-hmm. and you know realizing what they are and and not not let them run away with themselves but the bipolar i you know you just your mind is constantly running things and you know for me it's different different scenarios of walking down the street or you know interactions and and you know hotel restaurants or something or you know i don't know i weird run i i run weird scenarios through my head sometimes Sometimes just to keep it occupied so it doesn't focus on one thing. And how how has this affected like your your work life? Like have you had like any problems like with your going to work or with lashing out at like coworkers or anything like that? Yeah, I, I did. And I I uh was volunteering at a place and I had a mental breakdown and they let me come back, but then they hired somebody else, you know, kind of, kind of pushed me out, which was okay. I understand why they did it. So I would say it has affected me. I haven't really worked uh, since then. And that's been since uh, 2008. I, I, I'm on social security most of the time. I get social security. So that's how I support myself. Trying to be a professional speaker, that's what I'm trying to do now. So we shall see how that goes. Is your plan to continue to share your story through your professional speaking? No, I want to uh, do a situational awareness talks. Ooh, I like that. I want to talk about situational awareness and be more situationally aware and through my uh, experiences in life. Because I haven't, I haven't been situationally aware in the past. It's gotten me into some trouble. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I can totally understand that. Yeah, 
I think we all we all could take that lesson yeah. from you, Joe. Yeah, Joe, let me know. Sign me up. Yeah, let us know when you do that <laughs> because, like, I don't ever want to go back and revisit the day that I uh, stood up in the middle of the office and told everybody they were a bunch of fuckers. Uh, yeah, because it, it, it really did happen. I think Dirty Skittles was there the day that that happened. I was. I heard about it. You heard about it. Yeah, I didn't actually hear you, but I I heard about it. <laughs> it was not my most professional moment. No, I can imagine not. <laughs> so joe what what so far has been the hardest lesson to learn through your journey <laughs> when, <Uh-oh. laughs> when to keep my mouth shut um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm still learning it uh, <laughs> because my mouth just likes to speak and my brain doesn't want it to <laughs> and sometimes I try to speak, think twice and speak once, but usually it's let's speak twice and only think once. So, <laughs> so if you could imagine somebody taking your same journey, what would what advice would you give to them? I would say be more aware of the underlying situation. Not the not the uh, not the uh, top of the situation, but what's what's below the situation? What's the underlying? What's the underpinnings of the situation? And what are you to learn from it? Mm. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, so do I. Because you know what, we've all been there. Yeah. So I mean, I I can't imagine totally. So I I apologize if my questions are so like off the wall right but i just i can't imagine going through something like that you've shared with us right like i'm like i'm very curious about it but i don't know how much to ask like i'm like in that moment when you're doing you know you're yelling or threatening president is it very real to you right like you're you're acting out of a real emotion that's happening like is it a reality that you're living in that you believe oh yeah yeah Oh yeah, I, I I remember most of what happened, you know, at least the highlights. So my friends remember more, um, but yeah, it was it was real and in in the moment. And I kind of at one point was like, "What did you just do?" But then I just went back to yelling. So yeah, it has been hard. It's when you know I probably realized subconsciously something was going on. That, you know. Yeah. It's just trying to try to get some help. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like a control freak, right? Especially with myself. So I can't imagine where, like how I would react in that scenario. Like, I feel like if you are in that moment and it's, it's real for you, like it makes sense to, to react a certain way, you know, but yeah. in retrospect and in hindsight, looking back, that has to be difficult, you know, yeah. to see the difference. Yeah. yeah for, I, for sure. Like, you know, they, we all say that hindsight is twenty twenty, but like when you can't even catch yourself in that moment, right? Because we all do it. We all speak before we think. But when you when you've caught yourself and you're on the other side of that, like I hope you don't like continually beat yourself up, right? Because that that's not that doesn't help either. No, and I I I, I did for you know a while, but. You have to get over that eventually and mm-hmm. move forward. And I think it's so interesting. So many, so many individuals that we get to talk to when we ask, like, you know, what are you doing? What tools are you using? Meditation. Like, I find that so fast. I'm like, I should maybe try to meditate because everybody says meditation. Yeah, it's not. It's not easy to start, but once you get into it, it it's it. It, it just starts to flow and yeah. you know even and just start with five minutes a day and then you know the next week move it up to seven minutes a day and then you know nine minutes and then 11 and you know go up to 15 minutes and you know do that for maybe a week or two i can't even get i can't even get past three minutes okay well, then if that's I, all you can do i have a little start. bit of I have a little bit of ADHD. I'm like, oh, like a squirrel. But uh, yeah. Russell Russell Simmons has a has a couple of books on uh, 
meditation. He's the guy that did the deaf comedy jam back in the nineties. I remember. And he said, I used to, I used to meditate at seven in the morning, every morning across the street from the world trade center when they were constructing the freedom tower. And he said, if I could do that, anybody can meditate anywhere. <laughs> I can imagine. Man. So I have one last question. You had mentioned earlier on that you had to stop reading certain books and, and watching certain movies or documentaries. Have you had to learn to set like any personal boundaries with individuals? Not really, because I, I don't have any personal boundaries myself. I'm I'm a pretty free willing individual. So I don't I don't really set boundaries for myself. I don't know, I, I want to experience everything there is experience in life i would just say i don't watch as much tv anymore that's really the only boundary i've I've set for myself i don't saturate myself with the governmental stuff anymore i'll i'll read it here and there but i won't uh, read it back to back yeah yeah um makes sense i'd say that's probably about the only thing i've I've done and watch my stress level other than that. It, yeah. Do the cats help with your stress level? Oh, yeah. Except for like when they're being little assholes because yeah, cats, well, cats are little assholes. Yeah, they are, but they're lovable little asshole. <laughs> yeah, thank God they can't talk back, right? But they, they yeah. do have like claws that will like scratch your eyes out. So. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Calypso and Joby, right? Yeah. Calypso and Joby. Plus Calypso and Joby. <laughs> You got any other questions, your ex? No, I, I am good. So Jack, or Joe, Joe, sorry, I saw the K and I was like, ah. Joe, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with? Like what, what message do you want to put out there for, for anybody listening and who could relate to your story? Oh, I, I just, I just want to say whatever happens in the mental ward, just let it happen. I mean, unless, unless they are, you know, there is something serious here on that, you know, they're trying to overdose you or whatever, you know, that and you need to self advocate for yourself, but you, you really need to let them do their work and go to the groups and get, a, get what you can out of them and, you know, come back a better person because there will be one day that they unlock that that won't let you out. So you need to be ready for it. Because it's a it's a big bad world out here, and you know being behind that locked door is 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 Disneyland, you know. Wow, and it's a it's a controlled environment. Yeah, you're told what to do. You're told where to eat. You're told when to, you know, when to take your meds. And uh, out here, you're not, and you have to do that all on your own or get help for someone. And luckily, I've, I've had, you know, both help from help from myself and, and help from people around me. So, yeah, I, I was just going to ask, do you have a really good support system around you now? I do. It's it's pretty good. I have, you know, some some of it's, you know, not as good as it could be, but, you know, I could stabilize that a little bit better. So, but it's it's for what it is. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. We'll need to check in with you later yeah. as your journey progresses. I, I don't want to lose touch with you. I want to know. Yeah, I want to know more. Joe. What happens next? And I hope that you do do the public speaking. Yeah, can you sign us up? Because we can tell you what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> don't say fuckers. <laughs> don't, don't stand up in the middle of your office and call everybody a bunch of fuckers because you immediately regret it. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> No, but I mean on a serious note, yeah, I wanna I wanna check back in with you. I feel like the more we get to meet people and they and we get to hear everyone's stories, I we invest. Yeah. We become part of our family and and we want to see the success, right? So like we want to hear what happens next and mm-hmm. for sure we'll we'll need to check back in. Yeah, you're number fifty six of the people that we that are new to us. So oh, okay. Now, now you're part of the family. Well, I'm number 56 on the list. Great. <laughs> I was like, what is that? Such a, such a high priority. I love it. Well, I was counting back the number of episodes. We're at like episode number 58 now. 
<laughs> like a couple um, of people we interviewed, we knew. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. Remember, yeah, we, right, we did right. have family and friends. Yeah, for a while. Yeah, there was comfort there. You know? There was comfort. Now we now we broaden our horizons. Yeah. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate you sharing your story. Honestly, yeah, I do too. I'm sorry if I asked anything that was weird or. Oh, not at all. I appreciate you. No, no, I I had four stepdads as a kid, so there's pretty much nothing I want to talk about. My mom was a nurse, so okay. (laughs) There's nothing (laughs) we could (laughs) talk about in my family. (laughs) Not nothing sacred. No, no, nothing, (laughs) nothing at all. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Joe, 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 Joe. Hi, all. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I'm G-Rex. And I'm Dirty Skittles. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. We'd love to listen to your feedback. We can't do this without you guys. It's okay to be not okay. Just make sure you're talking to someone. <laughs>